Hi, Lester, Wish Your Engineer. As I've mentioned in a few of my recent videos, the Wushu scientist has recently completed her master's research study entitled Investigation into Intra-Abdominal Pressure and Neuromuscular Activation uh, to Increase Force Production in Traditional Martial Arts Practitioners. The study was performed through the University of Southern Queensland, uh, Australia, in collaboration with the Martial Arts Research and Testing Lab Laboratory, or MARTEL. I recently received a request from Matt, one of my viewers, to discuss the Wushu scientist's uh, study in more detail. Although the study has been successfully completed and uh, has uncovered some very significant findings, it has recently been submitted to a scientific journal and is currently awaiting acceptance. Some journals are very particular and do not accept data or manuscripts that have already been published in a public form. As such, I have been very limited in how much information I can release and this is why I've been a bit reticent to do a dedicated video on it just yet. However, I decided to provide an overview of the study along with its main findings. Simply following the abstract, uh, the abstract of the study, providing some interpretation of the results and showcasing my personal involvement in the study. It can be a little difficult and daunting to understand uh, the significance of a scientific study uh, manuscript if you do not have experience reading through them and interpreting results of data. As such, and for the additional reason noted, I will be limiting display, uh, displays of raw data um, to the bare minimum and providing an overarching explanation of what was done, um, why it was done, and what was found. For those who want full disclosure of the study, you will have to wait until it has been accepted for publication, at which time the journal article will become publicly accessible, although it won't be open access. I'd like to start this video off with a disclaimer that I find to be necessary when discussing the topic, because m many find this to be a sensitive matter for some reason, and tend to react to the necessary simplifications that I have to use when making a 20 or 30 minute long video. So for the purposes of this video, when, I, when I'm talking about chi, I'm simply talking about the physical phenomenon that has been used in traditional martial arts to achieve real, measurable, physical effects, such as increased striking force, for instance. I will not even begin to discuss the philosophical and abstract ideas that surround the concept of chi, because there's a lot of that. Um, and that's not, been, uh, that's not been part of our study. So while I know that chi is very real and measurable, I also acknowledge that there are abstract, philosophical and psychological connotations to the phenomenon, along with some more subtle phenomena such as the potentially bioelectric fields and nervous activity that may possibly be associated with it. I will only be discussing what we have found to be the defining physical system underlying Qi's main measurable physical effects. Qi, or uh, any one of a number of variants of this concept, uh, is a phenomenon that has formed part of traditional Eastern martial, art, martial arts for thousands of years. Many scientific researchers have tried to investigate it as a phenomenon associated with uh, either nervous activity, increased blood flow, or bioelectric fields with mixed results. Many modern martial artists discount its existence as being, at best, a method of describing efficient technique that arose at a time predating modern biomechanical understandings or modern medicine. At worst, it is described as a form of deceptive hocus-pocus, used to create a sense of awe in gullible students and onlookers. Sadly, in many cases, this, this kind of deception is real. However, in my case, I was fortunate enough to find a system headed by individuals of outstanding integrity, exceptional skill, and very sharp and logical minds, who not only had a demonstrable and repeatable working knowledge of the concept of chi, but who could also teach me the fundamentals and show me the ropes, so to speak. 
It took me a long time to be able to use the concept to do anything of any note because it is such a subtle phenomenon and very difficult to understand, but perseverance eventually started paying off. It was my practical understanding of this phenomenon, along with the instruction received from my teachers, that four years ago led me to start writing an article which is still published on the South African Chinese Martial Arts and Health Center website. And the article is entitled The Physiology of Qi and was my attempt to explain what I believed was the basic physiological basis of Qi. I have spoken about this basic hypothesis in many of my other videos, but I'll try to succinctly sum, up, sum things up here. The underlying substructure to the hypothesis is one of the essential underpinnings of science in general, and that is that for any phenomenon that exhibits real measurable physical effects, there is also a real measurable physical system that, underline, that, that, that under, underpins it. Despite the fact that the concept of qi is very closely tied with cultural, philosophical and abstract concepts in traditional martial arts, it is important to make this distinction, that it is a very real phenomenon. If qi does something in the real world, it will be governed by the same physical laws that govern the physical universe. Based on my practical understanding of the phenomenon and on what I had learned from my teachers, I postulated that there are two inextricably linked but fundamentally different systems that operate during all human action or activity. One is the conventional musculoskeletal system that we are all very familiar with and that is heavily studied in sports science. The other is a system of fluid-filled spaces, organs and tissues spread throughout the human body that acts a bit like a hydraulic or a hydrostatic system or skeleton. The second system is very obscure and although some studies have touched on it, has only recently started shifting towards main, the mainstream in terms of sports science. My basic hypothesis was that the physiological basis of the concept known as qi was directly related to the conscious control of fluid pressure and movement throughout the body. Qi is often explained as a form of energy, but energy in science is a very specific concept that requires a medium within which to propagate and a source to generate it. I believe that this, that, that the, the, the concept that has been explained that qi is energy or a form of energy is actually true in this case. Although I do not believe that the energy is anything otherworldly, at least not as far as punching, kicking and grappling an opponent is concerned. In the case of qi, I postulated that the medium through which the energy is propagated is the fluid that fills the spaces and tissues throughout the human body. The source that generates, modifies and controls energy is the trained and conditioned muscle tissue surrounding and interspersing um, the soft tissues, most notably in areas such as the pelvic cavity and the, inter and the abdominal cavity. The qi energy itself is either sustained or pulsed waves of fluid pressure traveling through the soft tissue of the human body, which is very similar to ocean waves driven by wind or tidal action. These sustained or pulsed waves amplify muscle contraction and modify impact or movement-based energy by subtly altering the mass distribution and acceleration of the limbs. For example, a pulse exerted at the correct time can coincide with a punch, thereby simultaneously amplifying muscular strength and altering the apparent mass behind the strike at the point of impact, increasing the impact force and energy in the strike. By altering the consistency of the tissues through which the qi energy travels, varying effects can be generated such as increasing tissue resistance to impact energy and damage, as in intention-based wushu iron body training, for instance. Although breath is often used as an explanation for qi, 
traditional Chinese instruction asserts that the lungs are a yin organ and should not be used to produce qi directly through increasing pneumatic pressure, that is, in the, in the chest cavity. Thus, it is not the breath itself that is involved in qi, but rather the structures such as the diaphragm and other muscular diaphragm-like structures surrounding the pelvic cavity, which are actually involved in the breathing process, which are themselves responsible for generating qi. Now, I wrote this article with a final tagline that read, now I humbly turn the stage over to my more learned colleagues and instructors to overthrow the model and propose a better one or to refine the idea further. Unfortunately, the years rolled by and no one took me up on the offer. So eventually, after much discussion with the Wushu scientist, she decided to continue her studies and complete a master's in sports science. We decided that together, we would tackle a study aimed at providing sufficient evidence to support the original basic hypothesis suggested in my original article about the physiological basis for qi. We hypothesized that trained wushu practitioners could produce higher intra-abdominal pressure, utilize a greater percentage of EMG activity of key muscle groups, and produce greater forces during isometric resistance tasks than untrained, healthy, active individuals. This would hopefully provide sufficient correlation between intra-abdominal pressure and force to form a foundation for further research in future. We approached a number of different universities who, alas, all rejected our initial proposal for various reasons. However, we suspected that the main underlying reason in most cases was that they did not want to be associated with something that they thought might verge on crackpot science, even though we had no intention of veering off into metaphysics. After quite a bit of disappointment, we finally found a willing supervisor for the Wushu scientists' study in the program coordinator of the sports and exercise department at the University of Southern Queensland. He openly confirmed our suspicions about the other universities in his in his initial response to our proposal, which indicated that he knew that there was some potential risk for ridicule associated with this topic, but that he was prepared to give us a shot. So we recruited a brave bunch of our students who agreed to follow a specific regular training program that incorporated a simplified Qigong breathing set uh, along with some simple resistance exercises combined with breathing techniques. The small band of brave souls who formed our test group followed the program for a year prior to performing the actual tests. We then recruited a bunch of equally brave souls who were not trained in our system at all, but who were matched with our participants as far as possible in terms of weight, age, sex, and in terms of level of physical training activity. This group formed our control group. Over the course of a few weeks, each of the participants from the test and control groups made their way to the Exercise Physiology Research Laboratory at the University of Southern Queensland, Ipswich campus. I participated in the tests myself, and I'll be playing some uh, footage from my test in the background for your entertainment. At the laboratory, participants were weighed and several preliminary tests were completed that included a pulmonary function measurement. Once this was done, a special catheter was introduced through the nostril into their stomach that incorporated two pressure sensors in order to simultaneously measure gastric pressure, which is a direct indicator of intra-abdominal pressure, and esophageal pressure, along with nine silver electrodes that measured diaphragm EMG. In addition to this rather unpleasant uh, invasive procedure, skin surface EMG electrodes were placed in specific areas on the, participant, on the participant's skin before several measurements were taken. Participants then repeated the pulmonary function measurements and undertook maximal respiratory pressure measurements before, before performing two tasks, the standing isometric push task and the standing isometric resistance task. These two tasks involved the participant producing in the standing isometric push or resisting in the standing isometric resistance, um, either producing 
or resisting a force close to or against the trunk while maintaining a stable uh, body position. These tasks were chosen because they were simple tasks which could be performed easily for both the trained and controlled groups. Further, both tasks were structured in, the, in a way that would reduce the ability of the participant to use their body weight to produce or resist force by leaning due to uh, strict constraints applied to the posture of the participant during the testing, which was confirmed with uh, camera footage from the side as well. To further offset the effects of body weight, the data were normalized for body weight. In other words, individual, individual scores were, were penalized based on the participant's body weight to normalize the results, ensuring that heavier individuals did not get to use their weight as an advantage in the tests. After the testing was complete and the data had been analyzed, a large number of significant differences between the two groups became apparent. I'm not going to get into all of the differences between the two groups of participants um, and will limit myself to the most interesting results. To save me going through reams of data with you, the following two comparisons between reasonably well-matched participants from the test and control group showing the raw data from the isometric resistance and isometric push tests illustrate the main essential differences between the two groups. And this is what the isometric resistance test results looked like. As you can see, peaking at just under 100 newtons, the trained participant could resist much higher levels of force than the control participant, who peaked at just over 40 newtons. The trained individual also resisted the force for a much longer time than the control individual, sustaining the force for over 20 seconds, while the control individual could not sustain the force for longer than 10 seconds before falling backwards. Additionally, the trained individual's force graph was, a sharp, was sharply cut off as they stopped the test, whereas the control individual's graph shows a rounded bump and trail off corresponding to them losing their balance backwards. In addition, there's a very strong relationship in terms of gastric pressure and resisted force in the trained individual with the two graphs looking quite similar in terms of the slope, whereas the control participants esophageal and gastric pressure only peaked at the end of the test when they were actually tensing up as they were losing their balance backwards. The test participants esophageal pressure remained consistent and low, except for the very end of the test when they were at their extremity. The various EMG measurements for the trained individual also show a slow and apparently linear growth in muscle activity as the force increased. This is what, now this is what the isometric push test results look like. Again, as you can see, peaking at approximately 200 newtons and averaging at close to 150 newtons, the trained participant could produce much higher levels of force than the control participant, who peaked at just over 50 newtons. In this case, the difference between the gastric pressure levels between the two individuals was very notable, with the trained individual sustaining between 150 and 200 centimeters H2O, while the control, while the control individual sustained just over 50 centimeters H2O. In both the test and the control participant, it was clear that gastric pressure was playing a role in force production. However, the correlation between gastric pressure and force in the trained individual was far higher, with gastric pressure reaching a peak along with the maximal force production. These results, more so than the previous results, showed that the oso uh, esophageal pressure in the trained individual only varied with their breathing, while the control individual held their breath throughout the exercise, as evidenced by the high esophageal pressure curve that followed gastric pressure. These results were similar to the other individuals in both the trained and control groups, leading to the following set of box and whisker graphs which show how the amount of force generated and the contribution of gastric pressure was significantly different in the test group. It's clear from these graphs that there was a statistically significant difference between the two groups in terms of both peak and mean force normalized for body mass as well as relative contributions of gastric esophageal pressure and relative contribution of transdiaphragmatic uh, tr uh, trans and esophageal pressure. The force graphs speak for themselves. 
in that the force that the test group produced was significantly higher. The relative contribution of, of esophageal, uh, gastric esophageal pressure and the relative contribution of transdiaphragmatic uh, trans, uh, diaphragm, and esophageal pressure may need a bit more interpretation. Essentially, these are an indication of the relative contribution of gastric pressure over esophageal pressure in the test, also showing a statistically significant difference between the two groups. The final box and whisker graph shows that in the trained group, the start of gastric pressure occurred very close to the start of either force production or force resistance. This showed that the, trained, that the training could improve the correlation or the connection between gastric or intra-abdominal pressure and force, and simultaneously strongly implies that gastric or intra-abdominal pressure is strongly related to force production in the test group. So in summary, the data indicated that the test group of specially trained individuals significantly outperformed the control group of matched individuals in the two tests performed during the experiment. In addition, the data suggests that the test group of specially trained individuals were using their intra-abdominal pressure to increase the amount of force that they could generate and resist. So what do all these results actually mean? Well, in short, as previously stated, they provide substantial supporting evidence for my original hypothesis that the main underlying physical system responsible for physically measurable qi-related phenomena, such as increased force production, is consciously controlled fluid pressure in the practitioner's body. So where do we go from here? Well, the Wushu scientist is intending to continue her studies with a doctoral thesis study starting next year. We hope to perform more in-depth study into the phenomenon and hopefully shed more light on this unique, overlooked and often maligned, misunderstood, but above all else, incredibly powerful treasure of martial arts developed over many centuries by some truly amazing people and passed down from teacher to student in an unbroken line to our present day. One of the many aims for the doctoral study includes the potential military applications of phenomenon of, of this phenomenon in such areas as load bearing, force production and execution of basic military combative maneuvers. I felt that it might be good to run a bit of a QA session with the Wushu scientist to get some of her perspectives on her recently completed master's research and on her future doctoral research projects. Well, um, well uh, thank you, uh, Wishu Scientist, for uh, being prepared to appear on the channel again. We always appreciate having you on board. Yeah, thanks for having me. Uh, first of all, um, yeah, so I'm going to be asking you a couple of questions just so that the viewers know a little bit more about your research, um, what you have, what you've done, your experience, and your perspectives and where you want to go with uh, your research. So first of all, could you tell us a little bit, a little bit about your academic career? Okay. Um, so, yeah, I started off with um, a, a Bachelor of Applied Science in Animal Studies. Mm -hmm. um, and then from there, we, I, we started the school here and um, training here, and I decided to get into more into sport science. So mm -hmm. I went on to do a graduate certificate um, in sports science through UQ. Um, and from there, I decided to go on to doing a master's at USQ, um, which is what we're talking about today. Okay. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about your martial arts experience? Um, yeah, so um, I started off um, shortly after, after I met you um, in Cape Town uh, at the Chinese Martial Arts and Health Center. I started doing um, Tai Chi first, and then mm -hmm. about a year later, um, started doing uh, Kung Fu training as well. And I've been doing Tai Chi and, and Kung Fu since then. Um, started teaching after we moved here to Australia. So how long has that been, roughly? Well, it's been probably about ne nearly 18 years now. 18 years, eh? Yeah, it's been a while. <laughs> Would you recommend the University of Southern Queensland to prospective students? Um, yeah, definitely. It's, it's been... I find that they've been really um, accessible mm -hmm. and so, so helpful. Like, especially my supervisor, um, he's just been really helpful and... Um, 
yeah, at the university itself, they, as um, as you said, they they were you know they were interested in in the research and and taking me on and kind of yeah preparing me, giving also giving me opportunities to um, to try new things with with the research. So I'm really grateful to them. Okay. Um, what about the the uh, field of sports science? Would you recommend that to a prospective uh, student at the university, and why? Um, yeah, definitely. The, or the why not? I should say. Okay. <laughs> well, yes, I would. Um, I think sports science is a really good field to get into. I think it's got a really nice balance of like fun, practical um, activities as well as lab lab stuff and data analysis and everything. So. It's 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 a yeah fun field and they're really well set up at USQ as well in in that they've got really good equipment and, and lab there. Okay. Um, in particular, would you recommend sports science at USQ to prospective female students and why? Yeah, definitely. I would. Um, it's yeah. I've just only been supported in in my my work there and and my study there, and there are um, a few female um, lecturers in, in, the, in the field as well. Um, and yeah, I haven't found any discrimination or any issues um, being a female. That's good to know. Um, did you enjoy your master's study? I did, yeah. It's been really uh, like, yeah, it's been a really good experience. Yeah. What, what were the most enjoyable or exciting aspects of the study for you? Um, I think for me, I, I enjoyed the um, the testing of, mm. of people. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I'm not a statist, but um, I I really enjoyed you know, getting people into the lab, seeing the results in real time, um, and then the other the other enjoyable like or exciting part was was when I was doing the data analysis and starting to see um, like calculating the the p values and seeing the significant. Um, data that was coming out of the study that was also really exciting. Oh, okay. Well, well did you um, did you re expect any kind of results uh, when you when you first started the study? Um, uh, what, it, what kind of results did you expect? Did you expect any results? Um, well, I'm, I'm always a bit of an optimist, so I was mm -hmm. hoping um, that it, you know the results would support our our hypothesis, but. I didn't really know what to expect because there, you know, we ideally it would have been great to have people all with 20 years of experience in the system and, and all of that, but we had quite a mix of different training um, levels. Um, and so, yeah, it was a bit of an unknown. Hmm. Um, so at the end of the day, were you surprised by the actual results? I was. I think the, the thing that, um, well, one thing that surprised me were the the forced results, mm. um, because we had like in the control group there were a number of quite you know strong fit people, and um, it was surprising. Like as I said, with the, the trained group, um, we had quite a range of of different levels. Um, so to see that clear distinction, statistically significant. Um, result in force generated and resisted in the trained group was it was it was surprising and that um the other thing was the one thing that i didn't expect to see didn't predict so much was the difference between the um the pressure the thoracic pressure and um intra-abdominal pressure mm -hmm. um which, sure. which i thought was really interesting all right um could you, for uh, for my viewers, could you sum up your results in a nutshell? Okay, so in a nutshell, um, what we found were, was that um, that trained martial artists are able to produce and resist more force than a, a control group, and that they did this um, through the improved control um, of intra-abdominal pressure and higher levels of intra-abdominal pressure when compared to thoracic pressure. Well, in a nutshell. So there you have it in a nutshell. Um, what could these results mean for martial arts in general? Um, so in general, I think that what we really, uh, it's, it may be a little bit um, 
like what I just said there, quite technical, but really what we um, are seeing is for the first time um, a way of really looking at physiologically looking at what is happening when a trained martial artist um, is producing force internally. Mm. Um, and that is um, it, for, I know for me, when I first started training, and I think for a lot of martial artists, um, it's really confusing think, talking about things like chi, um, what, what you're supposed to be feeling and everything. And I think that this can really um, contribute a lot to martial artists just to help to understand well what is actually going on that's really that's really cool it's exciting um so your your master's study is currently awaiting acceptance for publication in a scientific journal is it common for master's research projects to be uh, considered for publication in scientific journals um it's definitely not common um mm. the the thing that generally um a, a master's study is usually in, a, in an area that is um, kind of an established field. Mm. So they usually like just doing a little bit more work in that established field. Yeah. Um, whereas a PhD um, topic will be a novel new um, finding, mm. either in a new field or you know novel mm. adding to a field that's that's already there. Um, so that's why generally a master's um, study will not be, and also in terms of time frame. So mm. in order to have a study that is accepted in a scientific journal, it needs to have um, power in terms of the data. Mm. So in a master's time frame, it's hard to get enough data to have that statistical mm. power, to have statistical significance to show in, in a journal. Mm. Um, so yeah, most aren't. So, uh, so yours is actually quite unique then. It's almost kind of like uh, borderline PhD material to begin with because of its novel, uh, novel approach hypothesis and the significant results that you got from it. Yeah. And perhaps the one, the one distinguishing feature that kind of uh, prevents it from becoming a PhD, a full PhD study is the small sample sizes that we were able to yeah. yeah. How many how many people in both of those groups? Um, so we had nine people in each group. Nine people in each group. Yeah. So a total of 18 people yeah. involved in the test. Which was enough for mm. us to show statistical significance. But um, perhaps not quite enough to push it into the PhD realm. Yeah, and the PhD would involve generally... So that might be one aspect mm. of a PhD study. So a PhD study might involve something like that, as well as maybe a couple more studies just to to expand it out. Yeah. So the study that we did, I would say, would be, it could be very easily find itself in a PhD okay. as well. All right, um, where to now? Okay, so, well, I've, I guess I've gotten the, the research bug um, and, mm -hmm. and, and, and this is um, based on my experiences. Um, in, in this, I have decided to go on to do a PhD and um, so I'm going to do a PhD next year. So I'm just currently putting in um, the, the application for for the PhD, and what we're going to be looking at um, is basically looking at what we've done here, but making it a training study. So mm -hmm. the the question is, um, can someone off the street be taught? this in a, in a reasonable amount of time and and is that going to show improved performance um, what we're going to be focusing on in the PhD study is is actually load carriage and load bearing performance um, for for the military in particular it also applies to emergency services personnel where um, military personnel and um, emergency services personnel have to carry heavy loads mm. um, and it's quite um, it, it results in a lot of injuries and just makes it hard for them to perform their, their work. Uh, so we're going to be investigating whether exercises based on our traditional martial arts system, including mm -hmm. breathing exercises, um, can actually help to improve 
performance in that area? Yeah, on that on that um, uh, load carriage in the military, there's an old uh, there's an old military uh, uh, sort of one liner that goes something along the lines of uh, every uh, every soldier has to carry. Um, uh, an increasing number of pounds of the lightest kit available. Yeah, yeah, yeah. just keeps getting heavier and heavier. <laughs> the most technologically advanced, lightest materials, but still the, 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 the load just keeps going up. So it's, it's always a problem in the military. Yeah. Um, so is that all you're going to be looking at in terms of military training? Just, uh, just load carriage and... Uh... Um, no, so that's, as I said, that's the main um, aspect. Yep. But we'll, we're also going to be looking at whether this will improve um, strength. So we're going to be mm-hmm. looking at testing isometric strength in various, various movements, yep. um, as well as basic combat movements. So we, oh, get a chance, so, huh? yeah, we get a chance to start looking into things like basic basic strikes um, as well. And looking at, so we were going to have a train group and a control group, um, where the control group does a placebo program, mm-hmm. and the train group does a, a, a full 12-week, well both, both are 12-week, but a 12-week program um, in the traditional martial arts training. Well that's really exciting, yeah. yeah. Um, are, are you excited about that? Yes, I'm, I'm very excited about that. So what, what results are you hoping for? Um, I'm hoping that we will see significant um, benefits um, to strength and, um, and load carrying performance. But I guess most of all, really what I want to see um, is that the what we're talking about, the system of breath control and, and body usage mm-hmm. that, we, that we're teaching, which we saw in the trained martial arts students um, in the master's study, that that can actually be taught to a group of people in 12 weeks and that we can see um, the improvements in performance in that time. So, um, so but I'm reading between the lines here, but what... What I'm assuming, uh, what I'm assuming, based on what you're saying about, uh, uh, you know, teaching, uh, seeing whether there's a result in terms of uh, military combative maneuvers and uh, load carriage and that kind of thing, is that you're not necessarily uh, planning on teaching people how to do kung fu. No. You are giving them something that plugs in to whatever they yeah. are doing yeah. and makes it more powerful. Yeah, that's Is that right. My... That's right. And, yeah, to, and to clarify, the, the, the training program that we're, um, we're planning for them is not basically just a you know, traditional Kung Fu class. Um, no. it's, we're, we're looking at doing a specialized training program that's adapted from the traditional um, training specifically to help um, people to understand how to use Chi, if, mm. if we want to call it that. Um, so specific breathing exercises and resistance training exercises um, aimed at doing that. So um, the soldier of the future, perhaps uh, the chi powered soldier of the future. Yeah. Perhaps. Well, thank you very much for your time. Again, on the channel, it's always a pleasure to have you here. And uh, I wish you luck uh, in your studies. Although I'm saying it like I'm not going to be involved, I'm going to be yes, doing a lot of the yes, work. Yes, you are. I would, um, and it wouldn't happen without you. Sorry. As your faithful assistant, <laughs> Igor. <laughs> well, thank you for be- thank you yeah. for being on the channel. Thank you. We'll see you next time. Okay, see you. Well, I hope you enjoyed this video, and I hope that it's shed a little bit more light on what we've been getting up to in our spare time. Let me know if you have any further questions, and I'll see you all next time. Cheers.